This is the After Party, live with Kim McAllister. Pick a couch, grab a drink, and settle into the conversation. needed that Hawaiian music, the little ukuleles to kind of calm me down a little bit. I'm telling you guys, it's been quite the ride that this show is on the air is a thank you to John Daly, who after a hacking incident where the YouTube channel was overtaken by somebody and the uh, platform we used to get on the air was also erased. It was quite a mess. So um, thank you to him for making it all happen. And thank you to you for uh, being here today. I really appreciate it. We've got a lot to talk about. And uh, that includes the new PayPal link that is in the show description today. So thank you to all the people who hopped in and started switching over the new PayPal information really quickly. I'm so sorry for the inconvenience that we have to switch over and do it this way. But thank you to Nancy and Sue Ann and Maureen and Jim and uh, Lee Susan as well. You guys are awesome. Thank you very much for all the contributions to the show. This is the After Party Live, as you know, and I saw this picture last night on Facebook and I thought it was so incredibly beautiful that I had to show it to you. And then I thought, what if it's photoshopped? What if this isn't real? I have to make sure that it's real before I show it to you, right? And so I did a little research, and apparently this phenomenon is real. Now, I don't know about this particular shot, but it's a rainbow cloud or a series of rainbow clouds. And so I did a little research, and it turns out that's not fake. That's real. Mm -hmm. These pictures are from Sky News, and they were taken in December. And this is... Uh, this is a situation that happens often when air is really, really, really cold. So it, it they're called uh, nacreous or polar stratospheric clouds. They're very rare because there is just a set of specific conditions needed in order for them to pop up. Happened in the UK in December. Um, I it seems like. Uh, people are saying it's wondrous. It's amazing. Yeah. The weather team at Sky News says this is what happens. Nacreous or polar stratospheric clouds um, are pretty rare because they form high up in the stratosphere only when temperatures are minus 78 degrees Celsius, about 100 minus 108 Fahrenheit. So you're more likely to see them in polar regions, especially during the winter. So you, they, they're not often seen in areas where, you know, there's it's populated, right? But the sky looks like a shimmering mother of pearl, the clouds. Uh, they form about 12 to 19 miles above the earth. They're best seen before sunrise and after sunset when the sun is just below the horizon. And then the pastel rainbow colors you see there are due to iridescence when tiny little ice crystals or water droplets cause sunlight to be diffracted and then spread out. And that's what creates the colors very similar to those seen on soap bubbles or oil. It apparently is a pretty common thing at lower levels in our atmosphere and can be seen on the edges of clouds or near the sun or the moon in alto cumulus, cirro cumulus, lenticular, and cirrus clouds. Look at all that. So it is a real thing that happens, but look how pretty that is. All my life, I never seen such a thing. So we had this story that was like the thumbnail for the show yesterday. And of course, did I do it? No, no, I didn't. So let's get to it now. You know, we've talked before about bugs that secrete things, right? I'm not going to show you anything weird. I'm not going to tell you what orifice the secretions come out of. But I will tell you this leaf hopper does something really interesting. It secretes this material that comes out in little balls. They look like soccer balls in the way that they are formed. And researchers say these balls are developed in such a way that they 
deflect sunlight and make this leaf hopper invisible to prey. So it's kind of like he secretes an invisibility coat cloak, right? It's a, a complex geometry of these particles. They're called brocosomes. And scientists were looking at how they absorb visible and ultraviolet light. And they found that this stuff, whatever it is, it, it acts ra ranging from a, an invisible cloaking device to, um, n it depends on how much is, is there, to not much. They've got this, as you can see, little soccer ball-like geometry with cavities. The exact purpose for the insects uh, that, that they do this is something of a mystery. And scientists have known about this since the 50s, but they haven't known exactly why. So a couple years ago, a Penn State research team created a synthetic version of brocosomes trying to understand what it is they're meant to do. They say this discovery could be pretty useful for technological innovation. With a new strategy to regulate light reflection on a surface, they say, we might be able to hide the thermal signatures of humans or machines. Someday, people could develop a thermal invisibility cloak based on the tricks used by these little leaf hoppers. The work shows how understanding nature can help us develop modern technologies. Biomimicry, where it's at. You see an animal do something cool? How did they do that? So even though scientists have known about brocosome particles for a while, making them in the lab was a challenge because they're pretty complicated little things. They haven't understood why leafhoppers produce these particles with these structures. So they made them in a high-tech 3D printing method in the lab, and they found that the lab-made particles can reduce light reflection by up to 94%. And they say it's a pretty big discovery because it's the first time they've seen nature do something like this, where it controls light in this very specific way using these hollow particles. The leaf hoppers coat themselves with this kind of armor. And the thought is that it can keep them free of contaminants um, and it can cloak them from predators and such. Why exactly? They're still not sure. But it's all about the size of the holes in the broco uh, brocosome that give it this soccer ball-like appearance. And that's what's important as far as deflecting the light. No matter what size the insect's body is, the brocosomes are about 600 nanometers in diameter, about half the size of a single bacterium. And the brocosome pores are about 200 nanometers. So it doesn't matter if it's a little baby leaf hopper or a big one always the same. So scientists were looking at why is it this consistent? What's the secret of having 600 nanometers with 200 nanometer pores? Why is that happening? They think it serves a dual purpose, absorbing ultraviolet light, which cuts visibility to predators with UV vision, like birds and reptiles, and then scattering visible light, creating an anti-reflective shield against potential threats. The size of the holes, perfect for absorbing light at that ultraviolet frequency. And so, what could we use this for? What are we going to do? Have the Harry Potter invisibility cloak, you think? Maybe have more efficient solar energy farms? Maybe coatings that protect pharmaceuticals from light damage? Maybe better sunscreens, protect against sun damage, right? All of these things. This is where it's at. Little leaf hopper, look at you go. There he is. That's pretty cool. Yeah, pretty soon we're all going to be invisible wearing our little soccer ball coats. Um, did you see this story? This is Louie. Louie is not a bunny, but yet Louie won the 2024 Cadbury Easter Bunny competition. He's a raccoon. I don't know who has a pet raccoon. Somebody in Florida has a pet raccoon. Louie 
is the first of his species to earn this particular title. He's the he's the Cadbury Easter Bunny. Mm. The company says this two-year-old raccoon pet from Miami, Florida, is the winner of the sixth annual Cadbury Bunny tryouts, and that means he gets a role in the 2025 Cadbury Bunny tryout commercial, which is an Easter tra- tradition. They run these every every year. Since I've been streaming instead of watching cable, I haven't seen the commercials. But uh, the reason that Louie is a pet is because he was deemed unfit to live in the wild. But once they put him his picture up, apparently Instagram voters fell in love with his friendly face. He also has a mad skill, Louie. Louie, the pet raccoon, creates paintings to be sold to benefit wildlife rescue and rehab centers. So he is a talent, right? If in the beauty contest of the Cadbury Bunny tryout, Louie won the talent portion. Kind of fun. Um, fans participated in all waves of voting. They had 30 finalists from Cadbury fans across the United States. Uh, as a testament, they say, to the love for the Cadbury brand. So Louie maybe the first raccoon, but they've had other species. They had um, Crash the Rescue Cat, Annie Rose the Therapy Dog. They had a frog named Betty, uh, Lieutenant Dan the Treeing Walker Coonhound, and then they had an English bulldog named Henry. So, you know, little bunny raccoon. We'll take it. Kind of cute. Got everything but the bunny ears, so they just slapped those on his head. And he'll be in next year's commercial, so there you go. On the coast of Oregon, there have been some sightings, and they don't usually see wolverines walking around there, but they, they've had three sightings on the coast of Oregon where they've seen these wolverines just hanging out, walking through neighborhoods, walking through yards. Yeah. Uh, this wolverine wandered away from its usual habitat, and it's just now living on the Oregon coast. The Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife say these sightings have been verified during the last week in three towns, Nehalem, Natarts, and Newport. And I'm not sure if I said the name of those towns right. They're very common in Canada and Alaska, but they're very rarely sighted in Oregon. They, um, since 1936, they haven't really been around much. Just because this little wolverine is looking for a new home uh, doesn't mean that the wolverine population is going to explode anytime soon. They're not exactly sure where this wolverine came from or if it's the same animal that was spotted earlier this year in another Oregon town. But these animals are legally protected in Oregon. You can't hunt them. You can't trap them. So you just have to let this guy be. And that's that's good, as long as he's, nobody gets hurt. Nothing, nothing to see here. Move along, right? I don't know if you saw the story of this ostrich who went on the run. Yesterday, you know, we had the story of the the Rhea bird, and today it's the, the ostrich on the run. And I have a video to show you of this one. It gets pretty wild. This ostrich, he's a uh, he doesn't like to be held back. Oh, I have. Uh oh. Ruh row. I have it. Okay, here it is. I can make it big. Yeah. Look at right in the middle of the traffic. I mean, that's got to be a surprise. See it running like that. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. So they say it was safely captured. But it ran around traffic, freaked out a lot of drivers for a while. It's not not something you see every day running around, but kind of funny. I don't know what I would do if I saw that bird running through traffic and, you know, everyone kind of trying to swerve to avoid him. There are awards given out every year for wildlife comedy pictures. And there are 10 of them that ranked high this year. And so I thought maybe we could go through them together and check them out because um, they'll, they'll bring a little smile to your face, I think, even if we don't know the full story behind them all. 
they're pretty cool. So this is one of them. Uh, it is a couple of bears and it looks a lot like, I don't know if it looks like it to you, but to me, it kind of looks like they're having a conversation. So that's pretty funny. This one um, is, yes, it's part of the, uh, it's called Bear Jokes and it was taken in Montreal and it did rank high in the Comedy Wildlife Photography Awards. It's an annual competition and it's in partnership with Nikon. Kind of funny. Uh, here's another one. This one reminds me of uh, of Monterey. This is an otter. Let's see if I can figure out where I did it. Hold on. Nope. 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 It's the Wolverine. Sorry. Here it is. Okay. Oops. This is the otter. I'll get it right. Pretty cute. I think you're just otter this world, is what he said. That's a pretty cute one. Uh, the next one is a bird. Uh, it's a, a tough guy flying us for the week. Pretty funny. And then we have this monkey. The eyes. Really cool. They are pretty good. I mean, I don't know how. I know they use long range lenses, but they get so close and they get such incredible pictures. Look at this one. That's beautiful. This guy looks like he's jealous down here. Yeah. If looks could kill is the title of this picture. Beautiful birds. Wow. There you have it. Sleepy. Guess you're building a little sleep nest. A lot of sticks in that mouth. This one is um, is pretty cute. Pilgrimage. Mm. There's not that many more. We'll go through them. Oh, look at this one. Sea flying. Wow. You have to just like, it has to be the perfect moment. That's pretty funny. Seriously, he says. Beautiful bird. So I guess, you know... You get a funny picture, you enter the contest. Headless is this one. And that's it. Kind of worth looking at. There's a guy that loved to watch the squirrels run around his backyard. And so he did something kind of cool. He built them a picnic table. And then in the mornings, he would come out and scatter some nuts on the table. And then he'd go back inside. And he would watch the squirrels come down and sit at the little benches and eat the nuts as if they were just having breakfast. So he would do this while he was inside looking out the window, drinking his coffee and really, really enjoying this whole thing. He said he had some extra wood, so it really didn't cost him anything when he built this picnic table and he strung it up along his fence. They look so cute, do they not? A little squirrel picnic table. Adorable. So every morning he goes out and he scatters some nuts out there. Then he goes back inside. He said sometimes they sit on the benches. Sometimes they stand. Whatever. It's a dignified spot for them to enjoy their meals. So whilst he has his morning coffee, he watches the little squirrels. And he said that they come maybe twice a day to enjoy the nuts that he leaves for them. And they have gone viral. And I have the YouTube video of what they look like sitting out there. It's, I mean, you can see the picture, but the actual video is pretty funny. I think it's cute. Here it is. I got it. I show it to you. There they are. Just hanging out, eating nuts at the picnic tree in the sky. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you're bored in the morning or you want, you know, you're maybe a little lonely and you want to share that with someone, why not? Be kind to animals, have a little company at the same time. I just thought that was pretty cute. Yep.
coming back for more. Look at that. So yeah, a couple times a day, they just come and they hang out with them and they do what they have to do. Nice. This story is a little sciencey. It's a, a nanoscale look at how mollusks develop their outer shell. And scientists looked at uh, abalones, beautiful colors of shells, and they tried to figure out how that even forms. What's, what's it exactly made out of? How does it work? And why do they have this coating? What's the whole point of, of having this colorful coating? And so they looked at this at a very, very close level. Here's a picture of an abalone for you. And what they say is that it's something called biomineralization and that it's a lot more complicated than I re than they realized. This is from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And they looked at these sea creatures that use carbon and then lock it away in their bodies. They studied the edges of samples and they looked at coral and sea urchins and mollusks like this one, where temporary building blocks known as mineral precursors start to form the new shell or skeleton. And then they found something kind of surprising, that corals and mollusks produced a mineral precursor that had never been observed before. They've never seen anything like this in living organisms. And it only was recently created synthetically. So they found the variety and the types of building blocks present as precursors, minerals that lack a repeating atomic structure. They also found crystalline precursors. That's minerals that are more structured and orderly. All of this noted in the journal Nature Communications. They say one fascinating observation is that the coral skeletons and the mollusks mother of pearl form with exactly the same precursors, even though they evolved completely separately from one another. So the two species began making biominerals long after they diverged from one another on the tree of life. And scientists at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab say that's pretty cool because it means that making a biomineral in that way with so many precursors is an evolutionary advantage, energetically, thermodynamically, or some other way. And so what was it that made it be an evolutionary advantage? They don't know exactly. But they put it under lights, they looked at it in all kinds of different ways, and they, again, found similarities with these sea creatures. Interesting. I thought it was interesting. Uh, they said they have access to this fantastic beam microscope, best in the world, that give a nanoscale resolution and a depth sen sensitivity that they need to look at these things in such a way to study them like this. I've always loved uh, abalones, the way they shine in the light. So to find out interesting things about them, I think it's kind of fun. So Easter is coming. I don't know if you can see behind me on the desk where my Christmas tree used to be. There's two bunnies back there in honor of uh, Easter coming. And I saw this article about Easter eggs. Not real eggs, but the chocolate kind of Easter eggs, right? And not the little tiny ones wrapped in foil that are like the size of a Hershey's Kiss. Oh, no. Like, you know, we're talking Easter egg, right? A lot of people apparently, I would never do this, eat the whole thing. Get an Easter egg, you unwrap it, you eat it. Doctors say don't do that. Do not eat the whole Easter egg because it has so much fat in it. More than people realize that people get this, you know, down their gullet before they get exactly what they've just done to themselves. There you go. There it is. A little Easter egg for you. Yeah, they say cool it on the Easter egg, all right? Because an average Easter egg contains about three quarters of an adult's recommended daily calorie intake. Three quarters of all the calories you're supposed to eat for the day right there in that egg. Mm. 
So doctors are saying, have up a little moderation, you know, maybe why don't you have, I don't know, a bite or two now, instead of munching on the whole thing. Just be aware as you're going into Easter, if you've got a sweet tooth, if you really love the chocolate, that maybe you should not eat the whole thing at all. They say many people don't realize an average Easter egg contains three quarters of an adult's recommended daily caloric intake. And if eggs are combined with cakes or biscuits, it all adds up to so much extra sugar and so many calories. So they're saying, enjoy the sweets, but please don't overdo it, which is true. I don't know. I tend to on holidays like Halloween, I don't want to be like a big restrictor. So I say, eat what you want today. Tomorrow, the rules go back into place. Maybe I need to rethink that a little bit. I don't know. Uh, I saw this story. So interesting. This one is about um, more. It's another story about Pompeii. But when they looked at the wreckage, what they found was a home that had been under renovation. And it apparently is teaching researchers, scientists, and builders a lot about the strategies and the way that the Romans built things and they built them to last. Um, they found when they uncovered this, I'll get rid of that. Do we have to get rid of the chocolate? It looks kind of good. Um, they found that when they uncovered this home renovation, writing on the walls that the construction workers were using to communicate, right? They found um, all kinds of things that construction techniques that they were using, all of this ancient burial site in, again, the city of Pompeii, which was home to about 2000 people before it was destroyed by a volcanic eruption in 79 AD. Uh, there were more than 2,000 people that died as a direct consequence of that. So now archaeologists find what would have been, at the time, an active construction site, a home reno. The excavation, they say, is yielding important results for the knowledge of this ancient city. The home being renovated was adjacent to a bakery, that's where slaves and donkeys were locked up together, used to power a mill. Doesn't sound good. The atrium of the house was partially open to the sky, and building materials were piled up near a stairwell near the door of the uh, reception area that was decorated with a mythological painting of Achilles on Skyros, depicting ancient Greek heroes made famous for um, escapades in the Trojan War. They're piecing it all together now finding out how it looked, uh, finding out, you know, what their strategy was for building and how these structures, many of them that were built by the Romans are still standing this many years later. So there's a lot more studying to be done when it comes to this. But um, I just thought it was so interesting. All the different disciplines that you can find when you're an archaeologist and uncover things from art to building, all of this. They found Roman numerals written in charcoal. They think those were notes made by the construction workers. Uh, they also found jars, tools like lead weights for pulling up heavy walls, iron hose uh, to mix mortar in a nearby house that was reachable from an internal door. They found a large residence behind the two houses. They've only just started looking at that one. They have enormous piles of stones. So they would, I guess, do what we do today, you know, dump them and then start building with them. Evidence that maybe another large construction site may have been found too, and maybe that will yield more information. So... They have ceramics and tiles collected to be transformed into art. It was a, a common floor covering at the time, made with plaster and crushed bricks. So all of these things, so interesting. Uh, they found 
quicklime that they used to plaster the walls. It had been pre-mixed with water before it was used. And the discoveries show how the workers mixed it with water right on site before they used it. That meant it was very hot to use, but effective in giving a long-lasting hardened surface, which is in line with recent research, they say, that shows ancient concrete and construction outlasts more recent concrete. Yeah. So this is all um, under review and under study, but it it all goes to how the, the ancient Romans lived and what we can find out about them and all the different aspects of their lives from art to what they ate, to what they did for fun, to how they got around in carriages and other things, to how they treated their animals and people, to how they built things. They said without this type of cement, we wouldn't have the Colosseum, nor the Pantheon, um, nor the baths of Carcalla. So all of these things are important to understanding why the um, these buildings have withstood the test of time. I another lottery story. I gotta love a lottery story, even though I didn't win the lottery last night. And thank you to Luis for um for insisting that I play. I did win four dollars. I spent ten. I won four, so I'm out six. Mm, maybe I'll I'll let it ride on the uh, the Powerball that's playing tonight. But this guy, and it's funny, um, Mark was talking about a, a hot dog earlier from Costco. This this guy gets a hankering for a hot dog. And so he decides he's going to stop for a hot dog. And when he does, he's like, ah, might as well play the lottery. Here for a hot dog. So, you know, why not? He goes in, buys his hot dog, buys whatever it is he needs, and then he buys a lottery ticket. And so just because he had a hankering for a hot dog, trying to show you the picture, he ends up winning a cool mill, a hot dog and a cool mill. And so, yeah, it's just, just a bunch of scratchers, but yeah, so he stops for a hot dog. He walks away with a million dollars happened in North Carolina. Wish it would happen to me. He got it at a convenience store, buys the scratch-off lottery ticket worth a million dollars at the Jerry's One Stop in Iron Station. He decides to buy a $10, 50 times the cash scratch-off lottery ticket. He then went, goes back to his car, and he goes, I scratched it in my car, and my first thought was, no way. It shows the $1 million prize. He said, it blew my mind. And he drove home to tell his girlfriend about the good luck. The first thing I said was, baby, sit down. He plans to invest his prize money. He said he's never won anything over $100 before. But you know what? He did now. Got a hot dog and a cool mill. I mean, what could go wrong with that? This, I think... Uh, might be in poor taste. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, yeah, I think it's in poor taste. Did you hear that Mike Tyson is selling edibles? And they're not just any edible edibles. They're in the shape of an ear that has been nibbled on. You know, they're trying to capitalize on that whole bite fight thing, right? And so... He's he's going on a tour to try to hawk these things. And some people at dispensaries are thinking, you know, this is kind of tacky. Maybe we shouldn't sell this stuff. You can see that there's a bite taken out of it. Apparently, when you open the package, that's what they look like. So they're edibles. They're being sold at um, marijuana dispensaries. And, it you know, it's being done in good humor, I guess. But some people are like, listen, Tyson's a guy who's been in jail for assaulting women. You know, he, he, this is physical violence, like brutal violence up and well above the level of just boxing that he did to someone. But here they are going on sale anyway. So yeah, he's doing this promotional tour at cannabis shops next month. He's got an event in Times Square. All of this. 
The, he had his boxing license revoked by the Nevada State Athletic Commission and was fined $3 million when he took a chunk out of Holyfield's ear. He retired from boxing in 2005, but earlier this month, he said, I'm coming back. So he's going to be fighting YouTuber turned boxer Jake Paul. The whole thing is going to be shown on Netflix. I remember Nikki saying that she was pretty interested in this. It's called Mike Tyson Bites. What do you think? Tacky or funny? I'm going to the chat. Tacky or funny? I I kind of think tacky, but I, I don't know. Uh, what an ear. So gross, right? Uh, if at first you don't succeed, try again. Oh, my luck is coming. Luis, thank you for the $5. You didn't need to do that, but I do appreciate it. We'll get them next time, Kim. There's still the Powerball tonight. All right, Luis, we're playing. Uh, Liz says tacky. Yeah. Jim says tacky, but maybe it'll give him an extra few bucks. So who knows? Mo? Mm, no. Uh, Meredith is with tacky. Jennifer's going amusing and funny. She wants some Mike Tyson bites. Lend me your ear, says Cameo. Holyfield should get a chunk of the profits, right? I mean, it's based on his injury. Lori says the same thing. Holyfield should be getting a piece of those profits. That's true. Uh, again, thank you, Luis, for the super sticker. Wes with a $5 super sticker as well. Thank you so much for that. Much appreciated. Uh, let's go to your toilet paper. All right. During the pandemic, I don't want to show you guys a picture of the toilet. I'm just going to talk to you because I don't want to show you a picture of a potty. I mean, really, I already subject you to pictures of bugs and some gross things. So we'll just do it this way. All right. During the pandemic, um, there were a lot of people filling in at KGO. And I got to talking to a fill in talk show host named Angie Coiro. And this was during the whole thing where you couldn't find toilet paper on the shelves. You couldn't find it at Costco. You couldn't find it anywhere. People were stealing it and carting it around in trucks and hoarding it in their garage. And she said, I have no problem getting toilet paper. And I said, well, where are you getting your toilet paper? And she said, oh, well, I order my toilet paper from this company called Who Gives a Crap? And we laughed. And she said they have funny sayings on the outside of their toilet paper. And she said it's bamboo and sustainable and part of the profits go to third world countries to build plumbing and toilets and facilities for them to increase hygiene and whatnot. I thought, all right, I need toilet paper. It's sustainable. I'm all about that. And so we have st we started uh, buying this toilet paper from... Who gives a crap? Now comes a study about fashionable toilet paper rolls making claims about being made from bamboo. So they did tests to see what's really made from bamboo and what isn't. Because you pay a little more for the toilet paper, right? So you want it to be sustainable. You want them to give back and build better plumbing and infrastructure in other parts of the world that don't have it. So they do this test, uh, the folks at Sky News, and they found that though bamboo is marketed as greener than regular paper um, and made from virgin trees because it grow, they go, grow so quickly, it's gra grass grows so quickly, right? Uh, it releases fewer greenhouse gases, which of course drive climate change. And so... They found that not all of, of this toilet paper that said it's made of bamboo is actually made of bamboo. They, they took samples from companies called Bamboo, Naked Sprout, and Bazoo, and those only contained about 2.7%, 4%, and 26% of bamboo grass fibers. Ba Baz Bazoo says it makes tree-free 100% bamboo toilet paper. And Naked Sprout claims the product is made from bamboo, but doesn't specify that it has other materials. So that's not good. They need to do a little audit there. Bamboo 
um, did change after they were alerted that, that they messed up. But I will say that I'm really proud of the two other brands they tested. Who gives a crap, right? And the Cheeky Panda. <laughs> and they found both contained 100% bamboo. So my toilet paper is good and I'm feeling great. They did the testing with an independent laboratory. Uh, the process, they said, broke down a sample of paper to, quanti to quantify and then identify their components. Naked Sprout said it's incredibly disappointed by this report that shows a low percentage of bamboo. Um, they say their products are the most sustainable option. Well, I think they need to order who gives a crap instead. So... They've decided, though, in this industry that they need to do better quality control and figure out exactly if what they're advertising is ex exactly what they're giving. So they also, who gives a crap, make bamboo uh, paper towels, and we get those as well. And it's interesting because the roll is taller, much taller and thinner, and the, the paper towel strips, you know, sometimes they come in the half strip. They're much thinner strips. So interesting the way they do it but i love it uh did you talk, hear about the devil comet we have a lot of stuff happening in the sky we've got a um an eclipse coming as a matter of fact a professor andy Fracknoy will be on the mark thompson show that's on i believe april 2nd and the eclipse is coming on april 8th so we'll have a little bit of time to learn about it figure out if we can see it um before we uh the day comes right so that's it. He'll be on April 2nd. But that's not the only thing that's going on. We've also, right as this eclipse is happening, got the Devil Comet to contend with. And it's supposed to be pretty cool looking. And perhaps, they say, you might be able to see it at the same time as the eclipse. And that, I have to say, would be a pretty cool sight to see the Devil Comet and the eclipse happen at the same time. I mean... Really, maybe we shouldn't hold our breath. But if it happened, it'd be cooler than a Mike Tyson bite. That's for sure. The devil comment. Yeah. Uh, they're saying we sh it's not something to be missed. It's also called the cryovolcanic devil comet in some circles. So this devil comet is set to be visible across the night sky over the next several days. And they say it could make an appearance during the big eclipse on April 8th. Since it only makes one orbit around the sun every 71 years, seeing it is generally a once in a lifetime kind of deal. It's a 10 and a half mile wide ball of ice and rock stretched out or highly elliptical uh, in orbit, it is currently heading in the direction of our sun. It has a core made of solid ice and gas and dust surrounded by a frozen shell or nucleus. And that nucleus is covered by clouds of icy dust called a coma that slowly leaks out of the center of the comet. <laughs> That's interesting. And it has a swirling coma. It frequently erupts when solar radiation opens up fissures in the nucleus, and that is what causes highly pressurized icy cryomagma to spew out into space. And when that happens, the cloud of icy dust that surrounds it expands and appears brighter than usual. It had a major eruption in July of 2023, first time in about 70 years. It left two distinct tails of gas and ice that made it look like it had devil horns. And it's continued to erupt fairly frequently, I guess. But that's why it's called the Devil Comet, because of its devil horns. So throughout the next weeks, a uh, few weeks, the Devil Comet, also called Pons Brooks, which is not nearly as exciting, could be visible to the naked eye as it travels through the inner solar system, and it will remain so until April 2nd as it travels closer to the sun and then won't be visible in the uh, dark night sky. It'll be closest to Earth June 2nd when it's headed away from the sun. So it doesn't pose any threat to Earth. It'll be about 140 million miles away from us. Where's Satan when you need him for the devil comet? That's what I want to know.
But this thing is going to become more active in the coming weeks. And you should be able to see it with the naked eye as well because of its brightness and because of how big it is. So, and they say the lower the magnitude of it, the brighter the appearance as well. The limit for the naked eye objects in the dark is about six magnitudes. This will be at four. So we should be able to see it. But it won't be super obvious in the sky. You're going to have to really look for it. It'll look like a glowing ball of ice with forked horns right behind it. I can't wait. This is going to be good. Uh, my son got a, Santa brought a telescope to him for his, uh, for Christmas. So maybe we'll trot it out there and see if we can't take a look at it. Kind of fun. So this, this story affects me and I don't know if you guys are like me at all, but wearing headphones for most of my life working in radio and also starting in music radio with loud music in the headphones and backstage at concerts, you know, where you have to stand for work. I have some hearing loss going on. It's pretty serious hearing loss. Now, I, I can hear everybody talking to me just fine, I think. But then my husband will say, you you can't hear that. Or I remember once um, there were like frogs or creatures, crickets, something making noises. And my husband and kids were talking about it and I couldn't hear it at all. I always have the words on the TV. So this, I know that I have a hearing loss, like this is not something that surprises me. But what I thought was interesting is the story about the four biggest early warning signs that you're experiencing hearing loss. And here, here's what they are. You're struggling to keep up with conversations. Should we put the, put the Mark, Mike Tyson bite, ear bite back on the page? No. Uh, you're struggling to keep up with conversations. If you constantly find yourself saying, what? Not what, but what? Uh, during conversations, they say it might be time to get your ears checked. Straining to hear when talking with others or keeping up in conversations is a big one. Uh, this, they say, can include finding it difficult to hear in the presence of background noise. I totally have that. Or regularly asking people to repeat what they've said or mishearing them altogether. I totally do that. Guilty. Number two, I've already admitted this, you have to turn the TV volume way, way up. When other people have to tell you regularly to turn it down, and they're astounded by the volume at which you've said it, it's a sign it's time to get your ears checked. The third one is your ears are ringing. So it's called tinnitus when you hear, hear that kind of buzzing or ringing sound in your ears. It's not always a sign of hearing loss, but it can be. Um, some people experience persistent ringing or buzzing, and it drives them crazy. Uh, sometimes it's pain or pressure in both ears. I don't have that usually, but it can be hard to hear on one side or maybe both. So that's commonly also associated with some hearing loss conditions as well. And here's the, the other one I was telling you guys about. Natural sounds may be more difficult to hear. Uh, birds chirping, rain falling, that can be a red flag. Yeah. Um, some people say they have trouble hearing common everyday sounds. Their turn signal. I can't hear it either. My daughter will say, turn signal's on. Oh, I didn't hear it. Go click, click, click. Can't hear it anymore. Uh, boiling water. The laundry machine chime. Little things that you used to be able to hear, you don't, you can't hear it anymore. So they say, if you don't address your hearing loss, guilty, uh, that it poses significant challenges to stay to healthy aging. Because if you have untreated hearing loss, it can be in, connected to increased social isolation. And I find this to, for myself, like if I'm at a restaurant with friends and or a meeting or something, and there's a lot of background noise and people talking, and there's people near me in a conversation, but I can't hear it, I kind of check out of the conversation because I can't hear what they're saying. So um, isolation, loneliness, balance issues, risk of falls, a continued emerging evidence associating, uh, associating untreated hearing loss with diminished brain health and mental sharpness. Hearing words fully and clearly can help keep the brain active and sharp. So if you're like me and you're like, I can hear fine, 
I hear as well as I need to hear. And maybe you've f- fought getting a hearing aid for whatever reason. Mm. Maybe we should go get our hearing checked. Maybe it's time. Mm. Um, okay. I need to thank you guys for signing up again on the PayPal. There's a new PayPal link. You'll find it in the show description. And Nancy and Sue Ann and Maureen and Jim and Lee uh, and also Susan have all signed up. And I so appreciate you contributing to the After Party Live. Uh, It's another crowdfunded show. I probably won't ask as much because I feel like I've been asking all day. By the time we get to this show, it's like... But you guys are always so kind, and thank you for that. Wes with a $5 super sticker, Luis with a $5 super sticker, and then we have Jim with a $5 super sticker as well. A special thanks to John Daly for helping me get the show back up and running. Really appreciate his help on that. And a special thank you to you, too, for spending your time here and hanging out, kind of mellowing out on the weird, interesting, kitschy stories that I found uh, over the evening. Um, it's too ding, dang expensive. What to, what's too, I don't know. What, yeah, I don't know. To get your hearing checked. Oh, Heather just signed up. Thank you, Heather. You're awesome. Time for a hearing test. Yeah, for me, probably. But see, I've had the hearing test. I know I have a hearing loss. It's just a matter of actually taking action and doing something about it. Walter says, I use a white noise app on my phone to drown out my roommate's TV, which he leaves on all night. Oh, no. Lori says that ringing in the ears or tinnitus can overtax your brain. She's got uh, one ear ringing, causing her a lot of problems. No hearing loss last time they checked. Thank goodness. Um, Sensory input without specific cause can overtax the brain and cause issues. I hope it um, goes away. Yeah. Oh, that was about the toilet paper too expensive? Yeah. Did you check out the the who gives a crap? Because they have sales sometimes. And it's kind of cool because... A box of toilet paper just arrives at your house. I never have to go get it anymore. It just kind of comes to my house. And also, and I love this, it's wrapped in a biodegradable tissue paper instead of plastic. So you see, I'm doing good things for the world over here, people. Or I'm trying to anyway. Uh, Grady's not a PayPal fan. Okay, well, that's the, the you know, that's, that's, that's okay. I just love that you're here. Honestly, this is fantastic. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, We'll do it again tomorrow. Tomorrow is Thursday, if I have my days of the week correct. And it is Trivia Thursday. And I've decided I need a partner for Trivia Thursday. So I've been trying to get Jim Liu. (laughs) He's a, a chatter. And sometimes when I put the link in the chat to have people come on the show, like the old callers of of talk radio, he'll often pop on. And I thought, well, he, he might be game. If anyone else is game, shoot me an email. It's Kim at the afterparty dot live, uh, because I'd like to have a back and forth with with someone to do trivia with that uh, might be interested. And I'm I'm willing to take suggestions when it comes to the category as well. All right. Um. Oh, that's good to know about Northern. Yeah, it it feels better when you're not, you know, unwrapping copious amounts of plastic. All right. Well, until next time, you guys have a great afternoon. Make it a great day. And I will see you back here uh, tomorrow morning on the Nikki Maduro show at nine, Mark Thompson show at 11, and then here on the After Party Live. Talk to you soon. Bye, guys. The After Party Live would like to thank the following contributors and viewers like you. get it right eventually.